like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the New Testament book of 2 John. You have your Bible open to this little book of 2 John. You're opening your Bible to the shortest book in the Bible and the only book in the Bible addressed to a woman. That ought to be of interest, not only to the women, but to all of us. And every book in the Bible has a purpose. We shall come to that in a moment. In God's divine plan to reveal himself because the Bible is God's revelation of himself. He reveals himself in these 66 books of the Bible. And here in the little book of 2 John. We began with verse 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth and not I only but also all they that have known the truth for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be unto you and mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of the Father in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I want to begin by having you mark in verse two of this book of Second John, for the truth's sake, for the truth's sake. This is for the truth's sake. I remind you there's 66 books in the Bible and each of them has a message to us and each message is about God. So if we open our Bible as a puzzle revealing to us what God is like, each book of the Bible reveals a piece of that puzzle. If you remove any book of the Bible, you do not have the completed written revelation of God to man. So we're not to trifle with any book. We're not to imagine that some book is insignificant. We're not to think that one tiny book like this is meaningless because God provides something about himself in this book of the Bible that is unique, that is distinctive, and we want to know what it is. I have a small rock wall at my house and I marveled as the people built the wall. It's one of those dry stack walls where pieces of rock go one on the other. And I marveled when they'd come to a certain little place and the fellow who was the mason putting the thing together had in mind exactly what tiny rock he wanted to put in that little space. You may have seen that rock lying on the ground somewhere and thought it's meaningless, insignificant. But when it became part of the whole, it was tremendously significant. And I saw that it had its proper place. When you're reading through the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, many long books of the Bible, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. It's a miniature Bible with two great divisions of 39 chapters on one side and 27 chapters on the other side. Big, long book of the Bible. This is a tiny book of the Bible. But yet it is just as significant because God wants us to know his word, to understand that he's written this book about himself and he wants to speak to us. One of the clues we find in this book of 2 John is found in the seventh verse. Would you look at it, please? God says, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. May I read it again? For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. 
Remember, we're dealing with the New Testament church and the beginning of the Christian faith as far as we know of it as the church that Christ formed. It's my conviction that the church started with Jesus Christ and his disciples and was empowered at Pentecost. And so now we're dealing with these new believers and helping them to understand how they're to live the Christian life. If you look back in the book of 1 John, just for a moment, in chapter 4, <clears throat> the Bible says, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now keep that in mind. There were those who acknowledged Jesus, but they did acknowledge not that he did have a body. They would not acknowledge that he was born of a virgin and actually had an actual body. They was all man and all God, 100% man, 100% God, the God-man, Emmanuel. And so if they came talking about Jesus but denying some part concerning the Lord Jesus, how do we know those people are deceivers because they don't line up with the truth, the truth of God's word. The key in this little book of 2 John is the word truth. If you look in 1 John again in chapter 1, the Bible begins with chapter 1 in 1 John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. This is tremendously significant as we think about a group refusing to acknowledge that he had a body, a real body. For the life was manifest and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also might have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. To have fellowship means to hold these things in common, to believe these same things, to believe this. And that's what we're dealing with. The Bible tells us when Paul wrote to one of his young sons in the ministry that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. If you turn with me to the book of Ephesians just for a moment, I want you to mark this expression. If you have it marked, you mark it again, please. When he wrote concerning the church in Ephesians chapter four, the Bible says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. That's verse 11 of chapter four. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Their objective is to deceive. But speaking of us, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. We're to speak the truth in love. I want you to look again at this expression in the little book of First John. Would you please, this precious little book, so precious to every Christian. He says in verse two, for the truth's sake. Does that strike you in the way it does me, for the truth's sake. The word sake, what we're doing, what we're believing, what we're engaging in. And he wraps it all around this expression, for the truth's sake. What you're doing is for the truth's sake. Your family is for the truth's sake. 
What we're doing in this church is for the truth's sake. What we're engaged in with our lives is for the truth's sake. How we deal with others is for the truth's sake. When we're debating whether to receive someone or to reject someone, we must consider the truth's sake. Let me give you an example of this in an entirely different realm of life. If you'll hold your place here and turn with me to this amazing story in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Samuel. If you'll turn there, please, in 2 Samuel. And the word of God begins with verse one in 2 Samuel. We're dealing with rebellion of Absalom against his father, King David. And the Bible says, and David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zurah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gedite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us, neither if half of us die, will they care for us. But now thou art worth 10,000 of us, therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king, this is King David, commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai saying, deal gently, mark this, would you? For my sake, for my sake, I know you hate Absalom. I know you want to see him dead, but he's my son and I love him. And when you go out to do battle, don't think of Absalom, think of me. Think of me. And when you think of how you're going to treat him, think of how you would treat me. And he said, for my sake, deal gently with the young man, even with Absalom. Joab paid no attention. They found Absalom hanging, as you know, if you know the story, from the bough of an oak tree, and they pierced his heart with darts and put him to death. They gave no attention to what David says. As a matter of fact, someone was told, go kill him. Why didn't you kill him when you saw him hanging there? Why didn't you go kill him? And the man responded to Joab, we couldn't kill him. We remembered what David said. And so we could not kill him. Read the story for yourself and it's full length. Because for David's sake, we were gonna deal a certain way with him. And God says to us, if you'll go back with me, please, to this little book of 2 John, in all of your life and all of your dealings and the way you handle things and the way you respond to people and what you listen to and refuse to repeat or you listen to and choose to repeat. Let everything in your life be controlled by the dynamic of the truth for the truth's sake for the truth's sake. There is no greater commodity we have than the truth. There is no greater charge God has given us than the truth. We hold in our hands and our hearts, we hold the truth and the world and the lost, everyone, the seven plus billion at this moment who live on this planet, all need the 
the truth. And once we come to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior, when we've asked him to forgive our sin and by faith trust him as our Savior, he comes to live in us, then everything we do, how we deal with every situation should be governed completely by the truth's sake. The truth's sake. How does this affect our lives? Before we look at this passage, I want to just give this background or foundation. If you turn to the gospel according to John, the gospel according to John chapter one. We know that the human penman for the gospel record is John, the apostle. The human penman for first, second, and third John is John, the apostle. And we know also that the human penman for the revelation of Jesus Christ is John the Apostle. So five books of the New Testament penned, humanly speaking, penned by this Apostle John. And in John uh, chapter one, he tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he tells us in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, notice please, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. There's always something popping up that people are teaching wrongly about Christ. There's always something popping up that people are doing wrongly and still call themselves Christians. The world is full of deceivers. Please remember, the most dangerous deceit is the deceit that's nearest the truth, but is not the truth. It may look close to the truth. It may sound close to the truth, but it's still not the truth. And so as we're beholding the Lord, Notice what John says. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent. The Lord Jesus Christ, co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent. He is God. He's co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. So how did God come to earth? The Bible says he was made flesh. We refer to this as the virgin birth. He was made flesh. He came forth from Mary's womb. Mary was a chosen vessel. She brought forth what God sent forth into the world. He was made flesh and dwelt among us. How long did he dwell among us? He was here 33 and a half years on the earth. And we behold him. If we want to know what the church should be teaching, it should be teaching what Jesus taught his disciples and what is enlarged upon in the epistles of those he appointed to write. If we want to know how the church is to behave, the church should behave like the Lord Jesus. If we want to know how the church should be approached, it should be approached the way the Lord Jesus was approached. If we want to know how the church is to respond, it's his body on earth, it is to respond the way the Lord Jesus responded. And so he is full of grace and truth. And when people observe us, we who call ourselves believers, we should be full of grace and truth. That's what the Bible teaches us, full of grace and truth. Why is this truth so important? Look with me, please, in the gospel according to John. In the eighth chapter, the Lord deals with some very serious subjects here. He deals with Satan in the context of this. He says in verse 44 of John 8, you're of your father the devil. How'd you like to be hearing that? Someone saying, you're of your father the devil. Now, we want to be nice to everybody. Nice to angels, nice to the devil. 
That's the elect lady's predicament in the second chapter, or second John, and the one little chapter God gave us. How am I to entertain? How am I to show love? How am I to treat people who are really not true? How am I to engage with people who are deceivers? How am I to respond to people who name something even about Christ or Christianity but deny who Jesus Christ truly is and how he came into the world? How am I to respond? There's no sooner an original till there's an imitation. There's no sooner the genuine until there's a copy. And so if genuine is Bible-based, Christ-centered faith, then there are many copies, many copies. How do we know? He said to one crowd, you're of your father the devil, verse 44, John 8, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. He knew the truth but did not abide in it because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, even in our dealings with devilish things, James tells us that the wisdom that is from this earth is earthly, it is sensual, it is devilish. He says those three things. It is earthly, it is sensual, that's where the word lust would come in, it is sensual, it is devilish, it is devilish. And it has no truth in it, if it's of the devil, no truth. So here we are trying to make our way through life in this world, trying to live the Christian life in a world full of deceivers. How are we to be guided? How can we find our way? What we must have is the truth. How important is the truth? It's all important. It's the thing that matters most. In the same chapter, while we're there in John chapter eight, look what the Lord says in verse 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Now let me tell you where some Christians run into lots and lots of trouble. They hear something. They don't know whether it's true or not. And they repeat it. We should hold the truth to such a standard with such value in our thinking. There are some things that are truthful, that are hurtful, and time and place does not permit that truthful, hurtful thing to be repeated. But there are many things that are not truthful and hurtful that should never be repeated as if there are truthful things being said. Christian, if you're a Christian, would you respond by raising your hand? Christian, Christian, child of God, believer. It's your responsibility to handle the truth the way God says the truth should be handled. That's what we're dealing with in this little book of Precious book, 2 John. Would you write these things down quickly? We should love the truth. Look at verse one, 2 John verse one. The elder, and that's John the apostle, unto the elect lady, I, I believe this is a real person, not, not something for meaning the church, and her children, whom I love in the truth. We should love in the truth. We should love in the truth. How many of you have met someone or you perhaps try to be someone and you think it's your responsibility just to love everything and everybody? We need to be very careful about that. It's very hard for me as a pastor to express some things that really need to be expressed. 
I said to a young person the other day, I said, you're backslidden. I know you don't want to hear it, but you're backslidden. And you need to get your heart right with God. It would have been easier for me to say, hey, sweetie, how you doing? But I must speak the truth in love. That's what the Bible says. Many people want to show the love but don't want to speak the truth. The Bible says we love in the truth. This love here is not a love that is sensual, not even just a love among friends. It's a love that God puts in our heart. It's the kind of love that can be shed abroad. It's Christ's love in us, loving people the way they ought to be loved, the way God loves them. It's a wonderful thing to know how God looks at us. Once we're clothed in his righteousness, once we have the imputed righteousness of Christ put on our account, once God sees us the way he sees his own dear son because I've asked him to forgive my sin and by faith trust him as my savior, I'm not saved because of some good thing I did and you're not either. I'm not going to heaven because I've tried to be a, a good boy or lived a life as a preacher. God forgave me for Christ's sake, not for my sake, but for Christ's sake. I was forgiven for Christ's sake, not for my sake. And God loves me and forgives me as he says, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, he loves me. And I want you to try to find the difference sometime and make a great Bible study for you to see if you can find a difference between the way God loves you as one of his children and the way he loves his own son. Did you hear that? I want you to try to find the difference. If he sees us as he sees his own dear son, if we're clothed in his righteousness, when God looks at us and you say, well, I'm hell deserving. No, 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 no. Christ is not hell deserving. I'm justified. Someday, I'll be completely sanctified and glorified. When God sees me as a justified person, it's not just as if I'd never sinned. My sin isn't just forgiven, it's gone. It's gone. You may have lots of records about things, but God doesn't have those records. It's gone. It is gone. And as he looks at me, he looks as as he looks at his own dear son. Jesus Christ was not a forgiven sinner. He was never a sinner. And to be justified doesn't mean that our sin has been forgiven. But God sees us not as if we'd never sinned, but as if we were never even sinners. And he's teaching us with this great truth that's taken hold of us. Think of that. Think of that for a moment. Think of who you are in Jesus. Think of how God sees you in Jesus Christ, how God sees you. Think of that. And God gives us, whether we receive it and practice it or not, he gives us the ability through his indwelling Holy Spirit to love people with that love. I dare say we don't see a lot of that expressed. But this book of the Bible is written to show us that we are to love in truth, meaning we understand the way God loves. It's not some emotional outpouring, some quivering voice. It's an act of our holy righteous God to commit himself to us. And you and I have got a long way to go. I'm joining in here with you to love the way we ought to love, as the Bible says, to love in the truth. To love in the truth. John, the elder, the apostle, the leader, the example man, wrote to this elect lady and says, I love you and your children in the truth. We're to love in the truth. And not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. I want you to mark that expression, known the truth. We learn in the truth. We learn in the truth. You know, people sometimes ask the question, what is Christian education? I just read it to you. 
You can get it in the home. You can get it in the church. You can get it in the Sunday school. You may build a building somewhere and say you've got a Christian school. Sometimes Christian schools don't teach Christian education. But it means you're learning in the truth. You say, no, darling, I want you to know the truth. That's off there. I want you to know the truth. No, no, no. We're going to bring this back to the truth. Would you listen while I quote this verse? You could finish quoting it with me. Paul wrote it to Timothy. He said, we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable. He said before that, thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. And then he said, for all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And then he talks about how it's profitable. For doctrine, that's teaching. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For reproof, that's saying that's wrong. A lot of people just live, live in wrong learning all their life. They never learned the truth. They never learned in the truth. A lot of men, a lot of men who are married to women who never learned how to love their wife in the truth. A lot of women married to husbands who never learned how to love their husband in the truth. In other words, the the way God's designed love. There's a lot of people who never learned to love their children in the truth. They bathe them in everything, try to do everything in the world for them, prove everything imaginable by how much they give them or what they do for them and say to them, but we are to learn in the truth. Not only love in the truth, but to learn in the truth. He says, he uses this word. Notice the word he uses. He says, which known. And all they that have known have known the truth. How, did, how, did he, how was he able to say they have known the truth? Because someone had taken the time to teach them the truth. They learned in the truth. Someday when I lay down this robe of flesh and soar beyond the stars to be with God, and we all come in one by one to have our inevitable meeting with the Lord. And we're going to have it. You may say, he was our pastor. He was our pastor. Well, what did that mean? He was your pastor. Well, I learned. One man stopped me the other day in a, in a store in another state. He said, I listened to you every night on the television, on every, every weeknight on Monday night, I listen to you. He said, you're, you're a preacher and a teacher. I said, well, thank you, sir. I was a little embarrassed about it all. I mean, I'm grateful. But what you want to say is, this is what we have learned. What have you learned? What have you learned? What have you learned? Nonsense? How to have a good time? What have you learned? What are you looking for? What do you want from me? What have you learned? If you can say, by the grace of God, we learned the truth from the man, that's all I want. That's all I want. We learned the truth. Be careful how you respond to the truth. Now, Everything I say can't be checked off as truth, 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 truth. I'm aware of that. Truth, there is a body of truth. What is this body of truth? What is this body of truth concerning God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Have you learned? What is this body of truth concerning the Bible? the written revelation of God, inerrant, without error, revealed, inspired, preserved, illumined. What have you learned? John is writing, what have we learned about the Christian life and living the Christian life and holiness? What have we learned? Take it in if it's truth. Pass it on if it's truth. Not only do we love in truth, but we, we learn in the truth. 
And he goes on and he says, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, that's embodying the truth, and shall be with us forever. That's the eternal existence of the truth. <laughs> Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. I want you to write this word down. Not only loving in truth, learning in truth, living in truth. Now the crisis is about to come. Deceivers are gonna to come to the elect lady. Evidently she's gonna to have to deal with people who don't have the truth. But because not only is she living in the truth, she loves it, learned it, living in it. Her children are living in it. And they're living in it. And you can predict their response. How would you like to predict the response of your children? You know what we're living in? We're living in the feel-good world. Oh, the feel-good world. And I'm thinking sometimes, what, what, what is it all coming to? I never thought I'd live to see the day. I never thought I would live to see the day of the emboldening of atheists who think it's their business to remove everything about God from the whole world. Well, I say, I've had enough of it. I've had enough of it. And you ought to say, you've had enough of it. Stop in your tracks, you God-hater and God-denier. Stop in your tracks. I never thought I'd live to see the day there'd be such an emboldenedness on the part of atheist. And the liberty of my soul is a gift from God, not a gift from the state. I don't answer to the state for that. There's a difference between God and country. There's a difference between country and government. I may displease with the, with the government, but I love my country. Oh, what a day, mixed up, confused day we have. What a mixed up, confused day. And I'm gonna tell you something else. Please get this. You're gonna to have to keep coming back to something all of your life. All of your life. You may live in the 20th century, the 21st century. <laughs> you may have known someone who lived in a century before, but people have to keep coming back to something. What is they keep coming back to? Truth truth. It endures forever. Truth. Truth. It endures forever. So churches who are the pillar around the truth, they want to adjust to whatever generation, whatever time. The truth of the matter is, it's the truth of the matter that we need. And so what am I to do? What am I to do? God goes on to say here, don't even bid people God's speed. Don't even be kind to them. Don't entertain them. I'm talking about Christ deniers who don't believe in the truth. I think the most tragic thing for me, and I say this with all sincerity, and I take blame for it. I take blame for it. That's not an easy thing for a preacher to do. The most tragic thing to me is to see such ignorance among God's people when it comes to the truth. And don't get all puffed up and proud and think, well, I know my Bible. You may be put to the test. Not only did this woman know, her children had been taught the truth. And she could predict what her children would do in their response. If you want to get something lined up, get yourself lined up first with the truth. And then try to help line up those you love with the truth. 
There is an irreducible body of truth God's given us. You can't, you can't reduce it anymore. <clears throat> it's an irreducible body of truth. You can't take any more away from it. If you don't have these things, you shouldn't call yourself a Christian. If you don't believe in the deity of Christ, that God became a man without ceasing to be God, if you don't believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God, if you don't believe in the supernatural new birth that only Christ can give by the work of his Holy Spirit, and I'll go beyond that. He established a local assembly of baptized believers on this earth to be the pillar and ground of the truth. There are certain things you once thought every Christian holds to this irreducible body of truth. So, look, here comes a deceiver. Here comes a deceiver. Here comes a deceiver. And when you go down the checklist, the deceiver says, oh, he's the most wonderful, winsome person you ever met. But he doesn't believe all the Bible's God's word. He believes some funny, strange things about the person of Jesus Christ that don't agree with scripture. Watch out. How do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? You deal with this because you've already been committed to love in truth. To learn in the truth. Teaching people coming along the truth. To live in the truth and as a part of your daily life. That doesn't line up with the truth. So the answer is you already have. We're going to deal with much more of this. But if there ever was a day when we needed this little precious book of the Bible in this confused, deceiving world, this is the day. God help us. Let's bow in prayer, may we? Our Father, we do thank Thee for Thy precious word. Help us as we move through it. Let it move through us and change us. May we have the compassion that we ought to have, the love of Christ in us. May we respond the way we ought to respond with Christ in us, the hope of glory. As we're called upon to instruct others, we think first and foremost about our children and grandchildren. Help us, Lord, to stay in the truth. When we place priorities and premiums upon things we do and our loved ones do, help us to not place anything higher than the truth. Christ's name we pray.